أصحاب المعالي والسعادة. Name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, peace be upon you all. We welcome you all to this event that witnesses the launch of a landmark event, which is a unique event in the area, bringing together experts and the elite of speakers in the industry of knowledge from all over the world in order to shed light on the humanity's journey and communities with knowledge, giving solutions and the best practices with regards to knowledge. So welcome to the Knowledge Summit 2019. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, for the first day of the Knowledge Summit of 2019. We will start the sessions with a session called Space and Sustainability. We have the speakers, His Excellency Dr. Nas Mohammed Nasser Al-Ahbabi, Director General UAE Space Agency, Simto D. Depot, Director United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs, and Anna Haley, CEO of Radiant Earth Foundation, and moderated by Ramia Farraj, presenter and news bullet editor, DMI. I think we'll begin with Anne's presentation, since that's the first presentation that's available. Would you please put up Anne's presentation once again? After the presentations, we're going to have a panel discussion. It should be interesting. We're going to hear all about the UAE's space mission. Right, it's there. Now yeah. the and here we go. Here. Okay. Good morning. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you uh, today. I just want to share with you um, some of the activities that I see going on in the global development community and as it relates to space and earth observations. I run the Radiant Earth Foundation, an organization that I funded about five years ago with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and uh, Pierre Omidyar, the Omidyar Network. Um, I have, however, been a remote sensing scientist for more than 30 years. And I can tell you I have never been so energetic or so hopeful about the future and what we can now do with Earth observations. There is an explosion of Earth observation satellites, which, as we'll talk about later, has its challenges as well. But when I was growing up and in college, there, were really, there was really only one Earth observation satellite. It was Landsat. It was launched in the early 70s. Now, this is, these are some statistics that I track. I have quit trying to update this graphic. There are over 600 Earth observation satellites on orbit today. Probably that number is closer to 700. And when you intersect that with data from aircraft, as well as data from drones, we are awash in imagery. That used to present its challenges as well because simply that amount of data is so difficult to manage. But now you intersect that with cloud computing and machine learning and the Internet of Things and blockchain, um, I think we're in line to develop new solutions for humanity. Um, in addition to having more satellites on orbit, their temporal resolution has picked up dramatically. It used to be that we would get a Landsat image every 16 days, but now we are imaging the Earth every day. Every inch of the Earth is imaged every day, and in particular by one company called Planet. This is a slide that I put together, and I keep current, um, on commercial space and the investments in commercial space. These are commercial companies, commercial space operators. The ones that have red around them have launched in the last year. You, so you can see how much activity there is here. Um, and I would also say that while this trend started primarily in the U.S. about six years ago, that is no longer the case. This is a global commercial effort uh, with companies from all over the world uh, launching. These are uh, radar satellites that are particularly valuable in, in the tropics where we um, 
traditional electro-optical satellites struggle through clouds, uh, but we see the same commercial explosion in Earth observation uh, there. And then finally, an area where I used to be the CEO of Planet IQ, uh, in commercial weather. There have never been commercial weather satellites on orbit until the last three years, and you can see there's a real explosion there. But what is so exciting to me, to the point where I recently changed the entire direction of the Radiant Earth Foundation, is what we can do with machine learning on Earth observations. I would argue that we are in the very, very early stages of applying machine learning and artificial intelligence to Earth observations, but I would also argue that it will present us with dramatic results. This is an example from Digital Globe Corporation um, that has done has doing a tremendous amount of work for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to map every structure in Africa. This is a machine learning application. It was done in less than a week for all of Mozambique, uh, and this is being delivered for the entire continent. It is used in the Bill and Melinda Gates census analysis as well as in their polio and malaria programs to identify uh, where vaccine is needed most. This is a project that my team did for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation where we were looking to monitor um, the operation of waste treatment facilities. The foundation pays for the operation of waste treatment facilities around the globe, but there's no independent source on how much waste is actually being treated. We've monitored these facilities um, using the Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data of the European Space Agency um, and have been able to correlate uh, the actual bills, if you will, from the individual facilities with what we're seeing from space. Finally, a fascinating application, which is actually not from space, but I love it so much I thought I'd include it. And this is a drone application. This application was done by the World Bank. It's to identify <coughs> structures that may collapse in an earthquake. The World Bank flew a large portion of a Mexican city here, intersected that with laser imagery as well, drone imagery, and street imagery, and through some machine learning, ended up at the first time through an 89% accurate estimate of building soft structures that would collapse in an earthquake without ever putting an engineer in the field, dramatically improving uh, their mitigation time. So what do we lack in, the, in, in implementing this? We lack training data, and we particularly lack training data in the global south. And that's my mission, that's why I accepted this great invitation to come here, is to talk to you about what we can do collaboratively to increase training data um, in the global south. We are at the foundation uh, next month releasing two very large data sets and all of the data that we release is free and open, whether you're an academic or a government organization or a nonprofit or a commercial entity. We're releasing data sets on land cover globally tied to the Sentinel-2 instrument and we're also releasing data on uh, the crops of Africa. Now that is just the beginning. This is, a, this is a long, long journey that we're on, but we invite you to join us in registering the data that you may have so that your own communities can take advantage. I think with that, I think uh, we have seen so much progress over the last four or five years. Um, we, some old problems, however, still persist in this field, and that is connectivity and internet connectivity, particularly in the global south. Um, collaboration and data sharing. Well, I know open data and open government and open knowledge is uh, often talked about, but many times data are not truly open because they cannot be made accessible. And so I think we as a global society really need to work on that. The biggest issue and one that perhaps this forum is also focused on is capacity development and developing professionals all over the globe uh, to help us solve these serious problems. Um, there are new problems emerging 
uh, those of privacy and ethics and geolocation and machine learning. Uh, there are issues, as we will talk about, I believe, in our panel discussion around how space is getting very, very crowded, and uh, the accuracy of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So with that, thank you. Thanks very much, Ms. McGlarese. And I'd like to invite now to the stage Ms. DePippo from the United Nations for her presentation, please. Second time's a charm. <laughs> so, good morning again. It's really a great pleasure for me to be here uh, and to represent the United Nations uh, in this important uh, panel. Um, well, uh, I would like also to thank the organizers because we once again have today the possibility and an opportunity in a way to spread the word on the importance of space uh, for sustainable development. Working? Not working? Okay. So, uh, we are quickly approaching 2020. Well, if we look back, uh, we see a decade of major changes in transformations in politics and economy, in sports and culture, in science and technology. Well, it was quite a turbulent decade, full of ups and downs, a moment of hope, but also moments of despair. We have experienced conflicts and migration crisis, forcing millions to leave their homes and even their countries. We face the consequences of one of the biggest financial crises that have shaped the global economy, and the world's population surpassed 7 billion for the first time in history and is still growing. And we have encountered devastating natural disasters and registered the increase of CO2 concentrations to level not seen in 3 million years. But there is also a lot to commemorate. We celebrate. Uh, we are going to celebrate, by the way, the 75th year of the United Nations at the UN Charter next year. So we celebrated the seventh anniversary during the last decade. We have seen pledges of the world leaders for a peaceful, just, and more prosperous future. And the international community has adopted global frameworks, including the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris COP21 Climate Change Agreement. And there were also major breakthroughs in science and technology. Let me highlight some of them relevant to the field of space. We discovered the evidence of water on Mars, processed the first ever image of a black hole, and discovered hundreds of exoplanets, some of which are great candidates in the search for life. Sorry, too quick. Uh, and while these are the news, uh, they usually make the headlines, there is so much in the space field that remain often under the radar. Space has played a role in many of the events that have shaped not only the last 10 years, but the last 60 years, 60 years of humanity. And after six decades of relentless progress, it has become clear that through its intrinsic disruptive nature, space is a game changer. And today, access to space science, technologies, data, applications, and services is not anymore a luxury available only to a small group of wealthy nations. The investment uh, of political, financial, and human capital are growing worldwide, and so is the overall value of the space industry. Established space actors, seconded by um, startups, new government entities, universities and research institutes, commercial sector and even NGOs are causing an unprecedented boom in space activities. This is the evidence that the promise of space for the society is becoming more widely recognized. And uh, it is now more and more obvious that to succeed in addressing global challenges facing our planet, space must be part of the solution. And its importance for the 17 Sustainable Development Goals is a prime example. In a recent study, we found that almost 40% of the 169 targets 
that are underpinning the 17 sustainable development goals are reliant on the use of space. And in fact, the study only included positioning, timing, and navigation, coupled with Earth observation, and it is safe to assume that the number would be, be, would be even higher with the introduction of telecommunication. Space has truly become an indispensable tool for the modern society. Without the use of space infrastructure, the likelihood for the member states to achieve the SDGs would be very limited, if not impossible. As a great example, space assets are key to addressing climate change. Uh, and uh, utilizing a space uh, significantly improves our knowledge of the natural phenomena and our capability, let me see if that's the right one, yes, sorry, uh, improves our knowledge of the natural phenomena and our capability to monitor changes to weather, the environment, and climate around the world. And more than half of the essential climate variables are dependent on space infrastructure. The amount of data produced uh, by Earth observation today is bigger than ever, as, as, as was said already. They provide the more accurate and holistic view of our planet and are triggering new applications and services, part of a flourishing market, also fueling artificial intelligence algorithms that can handle such vast amount of data. The United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs is embarked in a data project called Open Universe, rendering accessible and reducing the entry level for space science and astronomy data. However, in this data-driven technology uh, knowledge society, we are paying less attention to maintaining data archives, and as, as was said already. So I'm happy that, uh, I mean, we are one after the other. So think about this. While patents have an expiration date and they, then they become open, this does not apply to data, uh, because really all data have a scientific value. And also, uh, if, if we think about uh, what was discovered, uh, for example, the water on Mars, it was only possible because all data were reanalyzed uh, with modern data processing procedures and techniques. And so, uh, closed knowledge should have an expiration date, in a way. Uh, and what is true for space the science data is also true for Earth observation data. And moreover, keeping the data closed increases the risk of losing the data set forever if uh, something happens. So, space is also uh, crucial for managing disasters in all their phases. And remote sensing data enable modeling and weather forecasting, which help predict disasters, a uh, prerequisite for early warnings. Satellites also offer reliable tools for communication, while uh, space imagery and positioning become vital for relief and recovery, helping for assessing damage, facilitate first aid delivery, or locate those in need. And the list of benefits goes on and on. And at the time when climate change is rendering disasters more frequent and severe, when we see record temperatures and heat waves, island states losing their territory and biodiversity is being under great risk, we need to make use of all available assets to alleviate the suffering of billions and to stop the destruction of the environment and the planet. Despite the great success in expanding accessibility space, uh, we are still facing, uh, in accessibility in space, we are still facing, and in some cases, even widening the gap the gap in technological capabilities among nations. And while the number of countries who have managed to operate at least one satellite has doubled since 2000, it is not even a half of the 193 member states of the United Nations. Clearly, we have a long way to go in ensuring the benefits the space activities can offer are made available to everyone everywhere. And as part of its efforts to contribute to, the, to sustainable development, we, the Office for Outer Space Affairs, create opportunities to increase access to outer space. Our dedicated capacity building activities have already reached more than 24,000 people since 1970s, and we are constantly innovating our approach to ensure that it is fit for purpose. It is now when humanity faces the defining challenges of our time that we need to step up. 
our effort. And as part of our novel, modern, and holistic approach to meet the needs of the 21st century capacity building, UNUSA launched the Access to Space for All initiative in 2018. And uh, through triangular cooperation, the office works together with established space actors to support known and emerging space faring nations to enable individuals and teams acquire practical skills through the ultimate layer of capacity building, which is hands on experience. Access to Space for All encompasses a range of activities which correspond to the full cycle of, access spa of accessing space from research on the ground to satellite development and deployment to orbital activities and access to the International Space Station and the China Space Station for educational and research purposes. Overall, the long history of productive multilateral collaboration at the UN in the space sector is a great example of what the international community can achieve with robust institutional support, political will, and a common goal. The real life contribution space is making to our daily life is undeniable, and it is the best in, in the best interest of all to expand opportunities to enable access to space. And through the access to space for all, we are committed to make this happen. Expanding the space community is a noble goal as a space truly transforms societies. However, we cannot neglect responsible behavior. Unregulated proliferation of space objects would bring significant challenges to space operations. As we see more and more actors entering the sector and plans to launch thousands of satellites in mega constellations, the very sustainability of other space activities is at risk. In the worst case scenario, collisions of objects in space could render the immediate Earth surrounding unusable for decades. At the United Nations, we therefore assign great importance to responsible conduct in the Earth orbit and beyond. The international community realizes the challenges that lie ahead and is already taking steps to address them. In June 2019, the member states of the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space adopted the preamble and the 21 guidelines for the long-term sustainability of outer space activities. And about a decade ago, the space debris mitigation guidelines were adopted to help mitigate the issue of the growing population of orbital waste. These guidelines, despite their non-binding character, represent great results of multilateral years-long efforts and the consensus of nations on the urgency of these matters. UNUSA, in its role as the Secretariat of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space and the dedicated working groups, have supported the deliberations and played a key role in the process. To ensure uh, that emerging and non-space-faring nations conduct activities in orbit in a manner that is consistent with, responsible, with the responsible use of space for peaceful purposes, we have launched a dedicated project called Space Law for New Space Actors, uh, starting with the great support of the government of Luxembourg. Through such efforts, we contribute to raising global adherence to and awareness of the existing instrument on outer space. With space being a global common and the province of all humankind, supporting new actors to comply with provisions of the international space law to which the Outer Space Treaty is the foundation document, ultimately benefits the whole community. Well, to conclude, the future in space is indeed promising. Economic development, mitigating impacts of climate change, saving lives and property in case of disasters, or achieving connectivity in all corners of the globe. These are but few examples of what we can achieve through space. To enjoy these benefits, a safe, secure, and sustainable space environment is required now and in the future. And I'm honored that I had the opportunity to share these insights with you today. And let me conclude with a famous quote from one of the brightest minds of all time, Isaac Newton, who once said, if I have seen further, it is by standing upon the shoulders of giants. We are now heavily benefiting from the work 
of those who came before us. And now let's together harness the power of knowledge and space to change the world. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ms. De Pippo. Allow me now to welcome to the stage His Excellency, Dr. Al Ahbabi, Director General of the UAE Space Agency. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most compassionate, uh, peace be upon you all, and good morning. I'd like to thank the organizer for providing me this opportunity to share with you uh, the story uh, of UAE in space. I have a few slides just to talk about why uh, UAE is interested in space. So there is no difference uh, than other countries. UAE has identified space as part of its current and future. And this is uh, why UAE has been invested in space in the last 20 years. But the big question still remains, why space? Well, I can you know, um, assure that uh, space, there is risk to space. And uh, you know, by very simple comparison, 50 years ago there were two countries, the uh, US and uh, the former USSR. Today we have more than uh, 60, probably 65 to 70 countries They have space activities. But for different countries, there is a different interest. So space can be uh, you know, justified uh, for national interest. Space provides uh, great uh, capability. It's in fact, it's a dual usage. Uh, space also can be, uh, the interest for space can be for scientific, to advance scientific, to elevate the uh, community and the uh, society. Also, space can be a contributor to knowledge-based economy. Countries today, they just have, they have no, uh, you know, they own some space capabilities. For example, a good example, I think, uh, if you agree, Your Excellency, with me, it's Luxembourg. Uh, Luxembourg has a, a SES as a company that uh, has more than 60 satellites that are providing and contributing to their economy. So uh, that's not for military or for, uh, you know, a pure scientific, but again, for economy. It's also for social, as we, uh, you know, uh, learned today that uh, space provides great opportunities for us as people. The communication that we are using is part of it is related to space. Uh, navigation, uh, when we fly in the, in the, in the, in the nights, uh, airplanes find their way uh, through navigation, through satellites. Uh, communications, remote sensing, weather prediction, all come from space. A lot of technology that we are using today was designed for space. It's been off to what we use today. A good example, I, you know, it's the phone that we are using. The integrated camera in our mobile phones was designed for space, but it was found that it can be used in other product, and you can guess on uh, scale it, you know, in other area, in medical and in, in science. Space is also a tool for inspiring. Uh, also, it's a great platform for innovation uh, because still there is a lot uh, unknown in space, so the minds can uh, search. And also, it's a good model for cooperation. Uh, private, uh, countries might have some differences on Earth, but they cooperate. A good example, again, it's uh, the United uh, States uh, of America and uh, Russia. Uh, probably they might difference geopolitics, but they work together. American astronauts fly from uh, Russia to space. So, looking to the landscape of UAE space program, we have the first space agency. Our space agency was founded in 2013 as the first space agency in the region. Uh, we have three operators that uh, operate satellites. Uh, UAE operate and own 10 satellites in orbit different from uh, communication to remote sensing, and also now coming uh, science. We have eight satellites and projects, which means they, are, they will be launched in the next few years. Some of these satellites are contributing to climate change, uh, observing Earth, so it might you know, improve our understanding of the environment uh, issues, and this is again contributing to the sustainability development uh, you know, uh, on Earth. Uh, we have been investing, UAE invested more than around 20 uh, billion dirhams, around $6 billion in space activities in the last 20 years. Uh, we have three universities are providing space educations. 
We have five space research centers attached to our universities. So we are building uh, a society uh, empowered by knowledge, uh, using space as a tool to inspire and to educate. Uh, we have a Mars mission. It's a, a, a big story. Next year, UAE will launch the first scientific uh, uh, mission going to Mars. And I will uh, have a few words. Uh, another uh, project is a Mars 2117. UAE is, uh, uh, has set a bold vision that it will be a contributor in the humanity's efforts to expand space exploration by 100 years. So we, uh, UAE, is committed to be part of uh, an initiative that uh, humanity will put the first human on Mars by 2117. It's, it's a long-term uh, project, but it has a vision, which means that uh, we are focused to uh, build you know, the capability, the capacity, and the knowledge uh, in line with this uh, project. Uh, astronaut program, UAE uh, sent the first Emirati astronaut, Hazza al Mansouri. Uh, he came last month, and he's inspiring and also uh, you know, providing confidence to our people and our young people that it's possible uh, to go from desert to space. Uh, we have 1,500 people are working in our space sector. Uh, women well represented. Yesterday we have an event uh, organized by UAE Space Agency about women's space. Uh, it was reported that uh, in my organization, the UAE Space Agency, we have 45% are women, and they are not just, uh, they are in the core business. Uh, in the space doing uh, great uh, science and technology work. We have around 50 country, uh, companies that are working in our uh, space sector, which is a good sign that uh, we are moving to space economy. Uh, also, we have a lot of activities in terms of uh, astronomy. Uh, a few words on our space agencies. This was established in 2014, man mandated by the government to put you know, the right regulation and also to invest in people building capacity and also to uh, support research and development, uh, and also to be responsible for international cooperation, and also to oversight and fund the Mars mission. We have a team of 50 uh, people. I call them the dream team. Uh, we have a board, and also we have advisory committee board, which means an expert, international experts, they are helping us to put you know, the long-term uh, strategy. In terms of regulation, we have a uh, Recently uh, completed our uh, uh, you know, uh, sector regulation. Uh, we are lucky because we started uh, in 2014 new without heritage. Uh, this is gave us an opportunity to design our uh, regulatory framework uh, to be the reg regulatory framework for tomorrow, not yesterday. So we don't have a heritage uh, 30 or 40 years ago that we cannot change. So we issued the National Space Policy. It's a document uh, clarify why UAE is interested in space. We, this year, uh, the government approved the National Space Strategy, which is a roadmap for the next 10 years, uh, what we need to do, and also the space law. Space law is a very important that we need a regulation uh, for investment uh, and to also protect our local uh, operators. We are also um, uh, active in terms of uh, United Nations, and Her Excellency, I think, agree with me that the UAE is an active participant when it comes to international space guidelines and regulations. We signed four uh, treaties. We are a member of different organizations, and also we work closely with Her Excellency and her team to uh, further support uh, the good work that they are doing. Uh, internationally, we are very active again because uh, we think and we believe that space is all about cooperation. As a young nation, we are hungry for knowledge and for technology, so we cooperate almost with everyone. Uh, more than 28 uh, cooperation agreements, and we are also, yesterday we are hosting uh, uh, Russian Space Agency, and uh, the head of Russia Space Agency came, and also the French Space Agency. Uh, and we are actually um, organizing different events, and there's great you know, presence of the international space communities, not only uh, signing, uh, after signing, but also we are activating projects. Today we have a current space project with Russia, with the US, with Japan, and also with France, and we are expanding this uh, to secure more knowledge, networking, and engagement. Uh, education again. We are spending. Uh, we are doing a lot of uh, activities. We are. Uh, we do believe that uh, the core of our space program in the future is uh, capacity, and we are doing a lot 
uh, in cooperation with the, the educational institutions and ministries in trying to inspire and to train and educate uh, the young Emirati to come and join the space sector uh, and be uh, part of the successful story. Not only focusing on UAE, UAE is also is expanding its uh, space capability and knowledge to our region. We do believe that uh, we have a moral uh, mod, uh, obligations. So this year, UAE uh, leadership announced that UAE will establish uh, what we call Arab Space Cooperation. Eleven countries came together, uh, leading by UAE, uh, forming uh, what we call uh, the Arab Space Cooperation Group, which is we expanding, you know, the space activities uh, to the region. UAE not just only uh, establishing this uh, organization, but providing a satellite. UAE will fund a satellite for the Arab region. Uh, that satellite will help to fight climate change and also to will, will localize, you know, uh, natural resources and also uh, try uh, to get, you know, more information on environment, uh, environment, environment uh, challenges. The satellite will be built here in UAE and also will be a platform where we will uh, bring uh, some Arab experts to uh, help us to build you know, the satellite. It's a platform to engage the Arab community and the scientists and engineers uh, and to uh, provide a culture of cooperation. Uh, Mars mission is, will be uh, launched next year in July 14th. It uh, will be launched from Japan. It's a scientific mission that will go to Mars uh, and it's named the hope, uh, hope means al uh, amal bil Arabi, and uh, of course it, it named by His Highness uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid. Uh, and the idea of this project is uh, is to inspire the young uh, UAE, but also the Arab youth that for a better tomorrow. Uh, we are also using this platform. Sorry about this because it's uh, automated. Uh, we are using this platform. Uh, for knowledge. We are engaging with international commu space communities, with countries to acquire knowledge and to engage and to learn. And we, uh, our engineers, is more than 200 uh, engineers and uh, scientists, young scientists from UAE working on this project. Uh, this project on time, it will take seven months after launch to reach Mars. It will orbit Mars and collect some data and that data will be sent back to Earth, will be shared with the international institutions and universities. Uh, that, the, the astronaut program, I think you are aware that Hazza was the first Emirati and his colleague Sultan was a backup. 4,000 4, people applied to this program when we opened the application process. One third of the applicants are women and uh, Hazza was, um, uh, flew to uh, space on the 25th of uh, September uh, for a short duration. He was, uh, mission was a scientific mission. He did 17, uh, 16 experiments, scientific experiments. I can assure you this uh, is a sustainable program. It, it's not just only a visit, but it's a sustainable and driven by science. I think this is conclude my uh, uh, overview. I hope I give you uh, uh, a short summary of UAE's best program, and I will be more than happy to participate. Thank you. So we sit here. Can I invite our panelists to approach the stage, please? Thank you so much. We can open the floor to questions. I'm sure there are some questions from the audience. If you have a question, please just stand up and we'll pass the mic to you. Well, I know that I, I certainly have a question. And my, my first question is for um, His Excellency. Now, we all watched as Hazal al Mansouri traveled to the ISS this year. It was a source of pride for everyone in the UAE and in the international community. Why was it important to send an Emirati to space, Your Excellency? Uh, well, actually, uh, uh, you know, the, when the program started, uh, it was started uh, with different goals that we uh, have um, uh, s a comprehensive space activities. We have s uh, s satellites uh, in communication, remote sensing. We have a, a science mission to Mars. Uh, we have also uh, a lot of space activities internationally, but also a regulatory. So in order to have a comprehensive you know, space program, human space flight is a key. And the, the idea behind an astronaut, not just only in UAE, but uh, around the world, is to inspire 
inspire the young people. Uh, astronaut, when uh, astronaut walk in school or uh, university, uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, around them, especially young people. So countries, not just only us, but other countries are using astronauts to inspire the young people to go to STEM education. Now, regardless where they go later, but they hooked by astronauts in order to uh, pursue uh, STEM education. UAE is aligned with this goal. So Hazza al-Mansouri today, yes, he went to space, but today his, his big job is to go out and talk to the young people, try to elevate their uh, expectation, try to encourage them uh, to think big and aim high. It certainly was a source of inspiration for people throughout the UAE. Hazza al-Mansouri is now uh, uh, he's a local celebrity, isn't he? Now, Ms. Miglari, as you mentioned in your presentation, Open Societies, what are your greatest concerns with regard to the use of Earth observation to support an open society? Well, I think, as, as you've heard, um, there's a tremendous amount of private capital going into Earth observations, which I think is wonderful. I've run several commercial Earth observation companies. Um, but what I don't see equally across the globe is the investment in capacity development and the investment in truly making data open. Um, now, with that said, I would take my hat off to the European Union and their work with the Copernicus program um, is really quite tremendous. Um, I believe that they're really now leading the way as it relates to Earth observations and open data. Uh, but we're also seeing a tremendous amount of activity, particularly out of China, and a recent announcement that they're going to open some of their data as well. So making data truly discoverable and accessible is key, and seeing capacity development programs across the globe so that people can get access to that uh, for their own solution development, I think, is are the most important activities. Now, Ms. DePippa, you did mention um, promoting peaceful uses. Um, of outer space. What does this mean to the average person and how is the UN office actually promoting peaceful uses of outer space? Well, uh, it's, it's quite, uh, let's say, an articulated uh, I mean, uh, environment. On one side, uh, we have member states, so the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which is made now by 95 members, uh, and the overall General Assembly, which means 100, the 193 member states. Now, uh, one important point which gives you a, a certain angle on this, um, I, I took up duty as director of the office a little bit more than five years ago, and at that time, the members of the committee were 76, which means that in five years we have been able to increase the members, the number of members of about 25%, a little bit less. Well, this is a clear sign that uh, um, there are a lot of countries more and more understanding the importance of space and understanding the fact that they need to be part of the family in order really to help their own companies and their own new players to uh, approach space with a responsible behavior, which is what I was mentioning before. Why this is so important? Because you see a lot of new governments, okay, all governments, all space-faring countries really working a lot in, in, in the space field, but also a lot of new governments. But at the same time, there is this, uh, let's say, commercial market flourishing. And so, we, if we want really to develop what we call a space economy, we do need to maintain a safe, secure, and sustainable environment for now and for generations to come. So how we do that, we really try to uh, support uh, a transparent and, um, and really trustful environment. Uh, for example, we maintain the register of all the objects launched into outer space, which is a sort of a transparency and confidence building 
uh, tool uh, so that we also encourage all member states to register their satellites, to present what they do, to report on their commitment vis-a-vis -vis the, the guidelines on the long-term sustainability so that all member states in the world know each other and know the, the, the respective programs. It's, it's a good tool, I, I would say, to try to maintain a peaceful users. Your Excellency, if I may just change the subject slightly, you mentioned in your presentation the Arab Space Cooperation Group, and I know that you met with this group yesterday. Yeah. Can you tell us what the outcomes of that meeting were? Well, well actually, uh, it's, uh, the group was initiated early this year in March uh, with 11 countries. Now we have 13 countries that want to, uh, uh, two more countries want to join. Uh, we uh, have annual meeting. Typically, we meet uh, twice or once a year. Uh, this is our second meeting. We just uh, try to put you know, the basis and the roadmap for the working group. Uh, we have been um, you know, visiting uh, different Arab uh, uh, countries. We work with them closely, uh, sharing our humble uh, knowledge and capabilities to help them to establish their space program. We work with uh, Saudi Arabia and the recently established space agency with Wat Bahrain. They established their own space agency. Egypt recently they established their space agency. My team was there in Cairo for uh, before uh, one month, spending you know, a week, uh, not a week, but probably three days sharing with them our experience because we have been through this before and uh, we do believe that uh, we uh, you know uh, we, we have a moral uh, obligation and uh, of course you know our leadership interested to uh, share uae uh, successful story not just only in space but in different uh, sector to the arab world uh, as uh, her excellency mentioned in that last quote you know the more we the more space players in the region, you know, the better, you know, the, uh, the, the benefits, you know, and also, uh, you know, it will, uh, everybody will get benefit, not just only on the local level, but also on the regional and even internationally. So this group uh, will grow. Uh, more countries are expressing uh, their interest to, uh, to join. Uh, now we are expanding, you know, the, uh, the function of the group. Uh, building the satellite in UAE have a platform that uh, bring you know the whole uh, group together uh, because um, a group without or a cooperation without projects is, is, is almost nothing. Uh, so UAE decided to put a, a project you know for this group to work, to engage, to network, uh, and also to bring the culture of working. I think the future is bright. There are some challenges and difficulties. Uh, priorities are different from country to country. Uh, but I think UAE is helping uh, funding you know, the satellite, but, but also funding you know, the, um, uh, you know, the, um, the secretary of the group. Uh, we are um, you know, dedicating a team and uh, also place here in UAE in our space agency dedicated for the Arab uh, space cooperation. And one of the challenges mentioned uh, in a couple of the presentations today was space debris. So now that there's so much international activity in space, what are the concerns regarding pollution in space? Well, I, I'll start off. I'm sure <laughs> you're going to take the leadership on this. But I mean, having been uh, the CEO of a satellite company, understanding the regulatory process in the US, um, it's a significant process, but it should be. Um, and I, I draw the parallel to now that we're talking about sustainability on Earth. Why, at least from my perspective, being a U.S. citizen, is we've been a little late to this call. And we have done some significant harm to our planet. Are we going to wait until we're doing harm in outer space? to make this a call and cleaning up outer space is far more difficult, I would argue, than cleaning up what we have here at home. So I, I think it is a, of paramount importance that we have a global policy network uh, to deal with the issue. Ms. DePippa, you're nodding your head in agreement. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, uh, I would like to add that um, what I mentioned before, so this, the flourishing of the commercial market in space is, is one of the key elements right now. Because the point is that you, you heard for sure about a lot of mega constellations, so thousands of satellites which should be launched in the next, really in, in, in the near future. 
which have been approved, by the way, by the U.S. Uh, administration already. So uh, they are ready to go in a way. Um, and uh, and what we see is that there is a bit of mismatch uh, between the speed of the commercial sector and the speed of the international community to, let's say, to be in line uh, or to be able to provide the regulatory framework that I have to tell you the commercial market is really desperately looking for. So they really, uh, they want to work with us and that's also the reason why recently uh, we started to work more and more with the private sector we as, as the Office for Outer Space Affairs because having all the stakeholders at the same table helps in understanding each other and helps to create an ecosystem which can really go in the right direction. And Your Excellency, I know that the UAE Space Agency is taking measures to support sustainability both on Earth and in space. Can you tell us a little bit about those measures? Uh, we do believe that uh, you know, space can contribute to sustainability on Earth. So in this area, we are uh, building a number of uh, uh, small satellites, but uh, have some science. Uh, one satellite called Mizensat will be launched next year. It's, uh, it's been developed in Khalifa University, and it will measure, you know, green uh, uh, gases, and um, uh, this is, will bring, you know, some science. But also, we are working on this uh, Arab uh, satellite, which is a hyperspectral satellite uh, that will also uh, benefit, you know, the region in terms of climate change. Uh, measurements, environment, and localized natural uh, resources. Uh, this is how to use space to help sustainability on Earth. Uh, on space sustainability, we are working with uh, Her Excellency, uh, an initiative that uh, within the UAE Space Agency, we try to build a center of excellence for space traffic management and also for space debris in terms of providing guidelines, uh, awarenesses. Uh, we are also putting the regulations, uh, local regulations and national regulations in our space law. Uh, for example, if an operator from UAE wants to send a satellite, uh, he has to do his um, uh, best measures in, in order to deorbit that satellite, not to add to the debris. Uh, we also try to engage internationally, try to promote uh, awarenesses why uh, space debris is a, is, is a big challenge. So we are taking measures uh, nationally, but also on the regional level, uh, space debris and space environmental regulations is one topic of the Arab Space Cooperation, because now they are designing their space uh, laws and space strategies. So we try to uh, share with them our experience, but also try to encourage them to consider you know, uh, space debris and taking you know, some measures that can help to reduce that uh, uh, problem. Thank you. We do have a question from the floor, this gentleman. Would you please introduce yourself, sir? Thank you very much. I am uh, Dr. Azam Kayase. I'm living in UAE since 40 years. Uh, I am gastroenterologist and I'm working on microbiome medicine. You know a human being is 1% gene, human gene and 99% microbiome. Are you going to study the microbiome in space and in uh, the earth by your research? So how will microbiology be studied in space? Microbiome, 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 the gene of the uh, microbiota inside the body and outside the body. How Is will microbiome be studied in space? I, Is that I, your question, sir? Yes, please uh, go ahead. Well, uh, two years ago we did uh, an, uh, scientific experiments where uh, uh, genes were sent to space. Genes? Genes. And, and this is where, you know, uh, we try to see the effects of microgravity on genes. Uh, that experiment returned to Earth and was studied and compared, uh, and it was published as a part of the international uh, scientific experiments. But uh, I think it's there. Maybe you want to share? No? Well, w what I can add is that uh, uh, there are a lot of experiments which have been performed that will be performed on both the, uh, both the International Space Station, which is there since 1998, and the upcoming China Space Station, which should be operational, I would say, 2022. Now, um, what we do, for example, to support uh, top-level scientific research in space is to uh, partner with spacefaring countries 
Um, for example, we have a strong agreement with JAXA, the Japanese Space Exploration Agency, to utilize the Kibo module on the International Space Station. And, then we, and we have also an agreement with CMSA, the China Man and Space Agency, to utilize the upcoming China Space Station. For example, in, um, in June this year, we announced nine scientific experiments which have been selected by us, by the Office for Outer Space Affairs, but the offer of utilizing the China Space Station was done by, by the Chinese, which means that we help the scientists because what they offer is a free launch, free operations on board, which means that for a scientist which has a good idea in whatever field you believe is, is proper and it's the right place, I mean microgravity condition is the right conditions um, in which you want to, to test your experiments, your, your ideas, well uh, this is an opportunity to access to space, access space in a, in a uh, let's say, more affordable manner. So my invitation is that you visit our website on a regular basis and it, you, you can probably uh, send your experiments through us on board the China Space Station on the International Space Thank Station. Thank you very much. Regarding uh, Mr. Hazza, did you make any study before and after he come back regarding microbiome study? Uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, what do you mean by... Uh, microbiome, because we can't take sample from saliva. We can't take sample from saliva or from the stools, yeah, there is yeah. study. And uh, when he come back, we can, can take the same. We see what is the effect of the space on yeah. the human being yeah. as a microbiome yeah. space yeah. life. Uh, of course, you know, one of uh, has the experiment that uh, before he uh, went to space, uh, the, he was analyzed medically, yeah. and when he came back from space, he spent two weeks. They tried to see, you know, the difference on his body, including all the cells, you know, the genes and the issues, tissues. Uh, and I think the result was announced that it will be in January. Uh, how is, you know, the microgravity effect on someone from this region? It's been studied before, like for European, for American, for Russian. But Haza is the first one from this region from Oria, yeah. with unique signature of, you know, genes and biology yeah, uh, elements. And, and uh, this is, will be published, I think, in January. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank our panelists for their fantastic presentations today and your excellent commentary. Thank you so much.